Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. All plants need water. Today, we're gonna to talk about the different ways to water them. Also, summer is the best time to start thinking about the fall vegetable garden. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Jason Reeves. Jason is a horticulturalist at UT Gardens right here in Jackson, and Walter Battle will be joining me later. Hey Jason, thank you All for being right. here today. Yeah, good to be here. All right, yeah, the UT Gardens here in Jackson. That's right. All Thanks right. for coming out to uh, no us problem. today. This is awesome. Sometimes oh, this I'm is in the studio, but it's great being here on inside. So. Oh, this is going to be good. This is a yeah. good hot day. It is. Today, and we're going to talk about watering, right? Yeah, yes, huh? we are. It's uh, it is a hot day. You can see I'm already <laughs> drenched, and uh, it's we we're going in a period here of, of of lack of water, and so okay. we're spending a lot of time watering, and so thought it'd be a great time to talk about different methods of watering. This so. is appropriate. So where do you want to start? All right, we're going to start out with one of the simple simplest ways okay. is watering by hand mm -hmm. and um, one of the easiest ways to water by hand is to use a watering one that hooks onto a water hose okay. and uh, I've been using a water one I guess 30 plus years and I definitely have my favorites and, and there's <laughs> definitely difference in quality so check out the different uh, qualities when you're shopping for a water one whether it's a local garden center okay. or online or the box store uh, but one of my favorite here um, is, is one that's all metal and has a metal head or rose or breaker they go by all different names okay. um, and it can be replaced if, if it does oh, wear so it out. Does come out. Okay. Yeah, it just screws yeah. on and off. So I wouldn't buy one that has a permanent head because if you mess it up and the, the remainder part is okay, you can't use it. it. Uh, one advantage to that metal head is if you drop it or you're out on concrete or asphalt, it uh, is more durable as opposed to this plastic head Got it. that's on the end here. Okay. Um, uh, we tend to use this uh, in the greenhouse, it's a little bit lighter weight, but outside on the ground, especially on the, the uh, concrete, we want that metal head. Okay. Now would you have to clean this out every once in a while? Yes, so I'm glad, you, glad okay. you mentioned that. Uh, you can, yes, if you end up with trash in, yeah. in and your pressure is affected, you can take this off and you know, either an air hose or just take the water and, hmm. and run in. Sometimes I have to take my finger in there and get little <laughs> bits and pieces that are caught. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that is uh, definitely important. Okay. Uh, you can buy these that have all different uh, size hose and more holes than others. I will tell you the finer that hole is, the more likely it is to get trash in okay, it and caught up. So it, you it. do want one with a whole lot of holes and they go by numbers and I can't even tell you what these are. <laughs> what I do not like is one that has an adjustable head up here that has the dial. So you know there's a fan oh, spray and a cone shape. Yeah. And the reason I don't, even if you've got it on the, the setting with a bunch of holes, it doesn't put out near the volume of water that this does. This got puts it. out a huge amount of water gently uh, and you don't have to stand in one spot as long to water uh, with that. So keep that in mind. Forget those adjustable things. Okay, forget them. All right. <laughs> also, the way the water hose, the, the, the wand turns on and off, you definitely want some kind of valve on there so you don't have to run back to the water hose so you're not wasting water also when you're moving from plant to plant right. or pot to pot. So this one has a valve that turns on and off by the lever system. Uh, there are all different quality of these. You can buy these in plastic, you can buy them brass, you can buy them in, in nickel. Okay. Um, and then this particular one has a built-in system yeah, called a One Touch, and okay. I love this. It's thumb operated. One Touch. And so right. it works really well. Uh, the one, the, the particular wand, wand that I don't <laughs> like is the one that has this trigger here. And the reason I don't like that, if you're pulling this across the lawn, you're pulling your hose, that trigger can get caught on things, okay. plants, Got grass, it. or whatever. Also can bre break off easy. Okay. So it's better, my, from my experience, to have something like this. That's so easy to operate. Uh, yes. okay. Or again, this, this valve here. Of course, one disadvantage of this, if this were to malfunction, you've got to get rid of the whole it. device because okay. it's built in where you can replace these valves um, on the one. But you know, a wand is a great way to, to water, particularly container plants. Um, and the, the long handle makes it a lot easier to reach in there. Okay. Of course, greenhouses and nurseries have been using these for years. So if you're using the one, though, how would you water your plants? Would you water over the top or would you water right if, at the zone? You know, zone it's best it if you matter? can get the water down low. Okay. Uh, I tell you, those of us who work in the industry and in the, the, our nursery area here, I mean, if we watered underneath everyone, we'd be here for days. You know, right, we sure, we got to go sure, quickly, sure, moving across. Sure. It's best to water in the morning okay, uh, because deal. you lose less water to evaporation. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, if you're watering late in the evening, there's a chance 
chance of, especially with overhead watering, which we're talking about today, of okay. chance of disease, uh, you know, fungus building up because you've got that, that water on the foliage that remains right. there all eating. So morning's the best time. You know, as working people, we have to water when we <laughs> when can. You can, right. So that's I right. water when I get that's home right. in the evening. Right. You know, I that's leave right. home at 5.15 in the morning. I'm not going to water in no. the morning. No. No. Um, and so when a plant needs water, it needs water. It doesn't matter Better. the time yeah. of day. Good deal. Uh, you know, the, a plant wilts for one reason, it's not getting water. Now, it can be not getting enough water for several reasons. One, it could have root rot from okay. too much water. Okay. And so okay. the roots are rotting, so it's not taking up water. It can be that it's so hot, uh, plants particularly high drainage, have big leaves, big flowers, they can't take up the water fast enough. Okay. So it may not be that the soil's dry, it just can't take it up fast enough. And then the third reason is, truly it is dry and it needs dry. water. Okay. So you always want to check your plant to be sure it actually needs water before watering. So how would you check your plants though? So I would check the soil. Okay. Check uh, the soil. And it doesn't mean the soil three feet away, it means the soil around <laughs> the base of right. the plants. But particularly when you've just planted a new plant in the ground, a little uh, say an annual or perennial, you want to stick your finger in the actual the soil it was growing in to begin okay. with. Till those roots run into the existing soil, it's not going to be able to absorb water. Got so it. put your finger down in there and visibly test to see if it needs more Good point. Um, and generally you're wanting to put a, a, approximately one inch of water on a week. And so whether you're doing that with the overhead head or the in ground and there are devices that you can um, you can uh, purchase that collect the water and kind of adjust for that particularly okay. if you've got the in ground system uh, but you know in, a, in the ideal world we don't get one inch of water yeah. once a week we get it in the ideal world we get it divided up about three times right. a week so that's kind of what you're doing okay. when you're watering you're watering a couple times a week that's if we're talking about in the ground if you've got containers it's a different story you may have to water those every day sure, sure. but in general one inch of water a week during during the the summer is what you need to add to your okay. landscape if you're not getting rainfall okay all right so then we're going to talk a couple of uh, different forms of um, overhead sprinklers and um, I've got several in front of me here <laughs> today we're going we're gonna to talk about. Um, the first one here is called an impact sprinkler and I'm going to turn it on in a sure. few minutes and there, I have different versions of this. I have this all metal one which is heavy which I really yeah. like. Because it's, it's heavy sturdy. it stays in place. Yeah. Um, if you've got good water pressure, as we do here, you, you cannot use one of these plastic ones. This will actually flop around right. and will, will f fall over. And you have to actually weight it down, which is a pain. So <laughs> I mean, when, when you're buying a, a sprinkler, look for one that's heavy, that's going to serve the purpose you're, you're looking for. Okay. So this impact, impact sprinkler also comes on a tripod that mm -hmm. you can I've set in those. the garden. It gets the water higher up. You know, if you've okay. got uh, lots of tall shrubs or, or plants, you may need to get the water above them so it's not blocking, the water's not being blocked. So it can be uh, purchased that way. You can also buy this where this is actually on a stake that you stick in the ground. I would don't advise that because once you get in the ground, if you can get it in the ground, if it's soft yeah. enough, right. once you've watered a little bit, it kind of wallows out the hole again if you've got good water pressure and you actually come out of the oh, ground. So you it. really need got one it. with a big base and again, metal is better because it's heavy. Okay, that's definitely heavy. Um, and then we also have this one that just makes a circle goes around mm -hmm. and around and around I've seen that a lot of and uh, it's not adjustable where this impact I'm going to show you in a few minutes oh, okay. is adjustable. Sorry. This just makes a circle uh, and you cannot adjust the pattern at all on it. Also this is floppy. I, this one falls over for me. Okay. I don't again so we get too much water metal. pressure. It's yeah. metal but it's, it's just metal. not yeah. big enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's the oscillator oh. sprinkler, which goes back and yeah. forth. Yeah. And again, we're going to demonstrate that. And we use a combination of impact and oscillator here, depending on the area we're watering in, uh, depending on the shape of the bed, depending on the plants in, in the area, whether, you know, I've got to go up and over them mm -hmm. uh, with the arch out of this or whether it can be lower down on the ground. So we're going to walk over here and demonstrate okay. these. Uh, both of these have, we have taken a valve like you see on the, the water one here. I've taken this valve and I have put one on each of these sprinklers, which is here for a couple advantages. One, it allows me to control the water pressure so I'm not watering a bigger area than I want, uh, but also just moving from one location to the other in the garden with, with the sprinkler. I don't have to go back to the end of the hose oh, and turn it off. off. You right. know, the long day here, at the end of the day, I don't <laughs> want to sure, walk 100 man. feet away yeah, at the end of the I'm hose, sure. turn it off to move the sprinkler. Right. I can adjust it right here. So this is really handy. Again, I've got this valve here and I'm going to turn it on with this valve, and again, I can control my pressure. Oh, there it goes. So that's the and sound. And so by adjusting yeah. these little tabs here, again, I can adjust how far it's spraying. So once it hits the stop, it turns and goes back the other direction. Okay. And you can see where it gets that sound. Um, so again, you can see the spray going out here by adjusting this little tab here. It keeps it, it, it brings it closer <laughs> right. to you. Uh, so it doesn't go as far out. I'm going to lift it back up. And then the screw here also adjusts the way the fan of the spray goes. So you can see 
Oh, that's interesting. It fans it out more. Got it. And so, <laughs> so on impact, we'll, we'll water as small as say a quarter of a circle or a pie, a piece of pie, or a complete circle, depending on how you adjust it. Okay. If you have really good water pressure, some devices like this particular one, you can actually hook another hose up and have another sprinkler on the nice. other end. But again, you got to have good water pressure for right. that. So this has got one where you can hook another water hose up to it. So, so is that the one you like to use the most? Uh, here, actually, or? I use the oscillator the, the most oscillator, just okay. because our beds here are okay. really not circles. <laughs> okay, got it. Now, that if I'm sense. watering a lawn setting, uh, this would definitely be a, a good way to, uh, to use, okay. or a good one to use. Except for the lawn, all right. Uh, and then the oscillating sprinkler. So yeah. the oscillating goes back and forth, yeah. oscillates back and forth. And again, I've got the valve on here. I'm going to go ahead and turn this one on. It has tabs that control how far back and forth it goes. So I've already got it set where it won't get me wet. <laughs> So it comes out at a fan shape, um, trying to pressure up a little bit more. And so you can adjust again how far out it goes by the amount of pressure, but also how far uh, you can adjust it by adjusting the tabs back and forth. Okay. So right now I've just got it going one direction. Uh, better quality uh, sprinklers like this will have tabs that adjust easier than others. Some of them have this dial that's a little bit more difficult. This one really works well. Again, I recommend a metal sprinkler. Uh, I've had these in plastic as well, and they, again, if you've got good water pressure, they can flop and cause a problem um, with, with uh, it flopping and, and not working properly. Um, this one also has a, a valve up at the top that can control the pressure as well, but it doesn't actually turn it all the way off. So again, I like that valve on the end to adjust yeah, it so it's completely good. turned off. Another misnomer is when the sun's out and water droplets hit yeah, a plant, so it does not that. burn the leaves. So it does that not is burn a the misnomer. Leaves. I was just about yes. to ask you that. Actually, okay. no wise tale, so don't don't worry about I'm that. Worry about it. Got it. Well, Jason, we appreciate that. It looks like you need to hop in the water. All right. <laughs>
uh, if you're going to use transplants. Mm. They need about 60 days to, uh, to get to this size. Okay. And uh, so therefore they'll be ready around October. So, so that's, that's really the best way to do them. And, and you want to plant them in, uh, on 36 inch rows and plant them probably, I'll say probably about uh, 18 inches apart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, 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 and they should do, do well. Okay, do now, you have a favorite variety? Yes, I like Stonehead. And I also like Red Rookie. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is yeah. that a red cabbage? Yes, that's a red oh, cabbage. Oh, yeah, red that rookie. makes great colored yes. slaw. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. That makes the slaw just even better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, and the next one I like to talk about, of course, is, is good old broccoli, which is just, wow. just, just healthy yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, mm -hmm. it just doesn't get any better. And, uh, again, you can, you can you, basically you can transplant them up to about, again, uh, August 10th, August 15th, somewhere along that line. You want to uh, set them out 36 inch rows, 18 inches apart, the plants. Uh, and I, I'll tell you that the, the varieties that I really like for the fall okay. is Emperor and Green Comet. It just oh, seems wow. like they can handle cooler weather a little better. Okay. Uh, from, from, from what I've seen, just, you know, planting them in my own garden. Okay. okay. Um, and, um, and then, of course, another one, of course, is good old cauliflower. And I'll be honest with you, uh, with both um, cauliflower and broccoli, I'll just eat those, just, just eat them. I, I, I don't even have to cook them. <laughs> okay. um, but, 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 but for uh, cauliflower, uh, again, uh, I would say in mid, seed in mid-July, transplant up to about, again, uh, mid-August or so. Takes about, um, I think, uh, 60 days for, for it to make a crop. Uh, so that'll put you again in, be ready come October. Uh, and the, there's one variety that I recommend okay. for fall planting, and that is Snow Crown. Snow Crown. Yes, yeah, Snow Crown, and, and it's a good size cauliflower. It has good size to it, uh, and I've had a lot of success okay. growing it. Okay. And then, of course, one of my favorite things uh -huh. <laughs> that I just like to, to, to eat now is, of course, turnip greens. Uh -huh. And... Your turnip greens, you really want to plant them, uh, you can plant them from August through September. And it's going to take you about 30 days before you get a crop. And now, the reason that I like planting turnip greens and, 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 and the variety that I like to plant in the fall is seven top. But um, the reason I like to plant them, I kind of line my garden a little earlier than most people <laughs> because turnip green seeds are very, very small. Yes, they are. So mm -hmm. what I usually yes. do, I mix them in with lime. Hmm. So the spots that I'm going to sow my turnip greens in, I also lime at the same time. Like pelletized lime. Yes, that pelletized like lime. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, that's a good uh, idea. Yes, it just kind of yeah. uh, is an easy way to sow them. And I, I usually get a pretty good uniform crop. Mm, and, uh, and, and, and like I said, I, I really like those. And of course, some people grow turnip greens also for the turnip. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. and, uh, and, and, and purple top is the go-to variety uh, for, for turnips. Now, when I cook turnip greens, a lot of times I'll even chop up a turnip and put mm -hmm. it in there. Um, but again, and, and they will last you throughout the uh, fall season. I mean, they, they, they'll last you throughout, e even on over into winter. As a matter of fact, once uh, it frosts on them, once it snows on them, they get bitter. And I really like those bitter turnip greens and put a little chow-chow pickle with them, and it's just real good. I bet you use hot sauce, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and next, Chris, I, I would like to also say, but, but fall gardening can also be extending the summer garden as well. Okay. And, and, and I'm going to use one of the, the big featured crops that we use for oh, summer yeah. gardening, of course, is tomatoes. Tomatoes. But you can carry them on into, really into November. Uh, you can uh, have you some transplants that you set out, you know, like in late June, July, and, and, and you'll end up getting some, some good tomato crops. Now, one thing that people should remember in the Mid-South area, you know, is November 13th, according to the uh, Tennessee Department of Ag's Weather statistics, history, somebody keeps up with all that. I don't know who does up there. Uh, they say it's a 50% chance of uh, first frost occurring on November 13th in Memphis. Wow, okay. So 
kind of do yeah so kind of do a little math backwards mm -hmm. and you can kind of see how maybe you can get your growing season in there to grow you some tomatoes right i even have carried tomatoes on up till about november 10th myself simply by covering my tomatoes at night mm -hmm. so that in case it did frost they would be covered but then once i know that it's pretty much going to be times when we're going to get a lot of cold weather and falls i just go on out there and pick my green tomatoes off mm -hmm. And uh, if you live in the South, well, you know. Fried green tomatoes. Fried green tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you can also set them in a window seal, in a south-facing window seal, and they'll turn red as well. So that's how you can kind of extend your tomato crop mm -hmm. to go on into the fall as well. Now, going back to our cold crop, so, yeah, if we get a, you know, a frost, mm -hmm. a freezing temps, are they going to be fine? They'll be fine. That's why they mm -hmm. are listed, you know, as cold-hardy sure. uh, crops, and, and they can handle that. Now, if you get some big devastating, you know, freeze right, event, sure. something that we rarely see or something, everything's kind of off the table there. Sure. But, yes, this is just getting hold of this stuff on a good <laughs> fall or winter day is very good. I can tell you like that. Well, we appreciate the good information, <laughs> man. And, and what a nice display. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Thank yes. you much, Well, We appreciate that. We've got a Baptisia plant here that we noticed a week or so ago was showing a little bit of bronzing. So from a distance, I thought that it just had a slight covering of dust on the leaves. Um, but upon closer inspection, we found that it was actually had a pretty heavy infestation of spider mites. And um, if you see this on a plant and you're curious as to what may be going on, you can do a white paper test. Just give it a little tap. And of course, on your white piece of paper, you're going to catch some debris. Um, also, shake off any of those spider mites or other insects that might be feeding on the plant. And that's just going to help you do a little more diagnostics with that. Uh, these insects are very small, um, have piercing mouth parts, and they're sucking the juices from the plants. And in this circumstance, I probably wouldn't even treat this plant. While there is quite a bit of feeding on it, it is not going to affect the overall health of this plant. If I were to treat it, uh, you would want to use a systemic product. I really prefer root drenches that we can pour around the base of plants that include a long-lasting residual active ingredients like imidacloprid. All right, here's our Q&A segment. Y'all ready? Yes, sir. All right. These are great questions. All right, here's our first via email. I went outside one morning to find what looks to me like some kind of fungus growing in my mulch. Mm. Do you know what it is and is there any reason for concern? And this is Julie from Crossfield, Tennessee. Oh, Celeste. Hey, so Julie. Any reason for concern? And what is it? Yes, yeah, so that was an excellent picture. I want to yeah, thank was, her for sending a really good quality good picture. picture. So that is, has a really gross common yeah, name. Yes, it does. People call it dog <laughs> vomit. <laughs> it's, it's a slime mold mm -hmm. that uh, commonly occurs in mulch. It, it's a fungus that feeds on decaying organic mm -hmm. matter. So like that's what yeah. mulch is, Smart. right? Shredded Smart. bark mulch um, is decaying and, and doing its thing. And so it would be natural that we would see this type of fungus develop there. Yeah. And there's lots of different kinds of uh, funguses that you'll see in mulch. Artillery fungus mm -hmm. that shoot Which out those cool. little, yeah, yeah it like is cool, but it's, cool. Ugh, it's uh, gross. Yeah. And it's hard <laughs> to get off of, of things. So, um, but these are just naturally yeah. occurring. So I would say, don't worry about don't it. Worry about it's it. not anything that's gonna infect your no. plants or cause things that are growing in the area to look poorly. Um, there's really not a lot in the way of control. They could just shovel up those areas if, yeah. if yeah. they wanted to. Um, and it's gonna be more prevalent in wet periods. Mm -hmm. So we're coming into a dry period right now. If someone had an issue right. with slime mold, I would expect that to be sure. kind of dying down. Yeah. You know, it amazes me how quick it grows. Sometimes you'll see it'll run up on the side yeah. of the house or yeah. on a tree or something that's not living at all because it, it spreads so quickly. Mm -hmm. that. Uh, but again, it's not gonna hurt anything. Not gonna hurt anything, no need to use a chemical. Thank you, Miss Julie. We appreciate that question. I think Jason likes this one. How do I prevent the canna leaf roller from eating up my beautiful mm. cannas in a pollinator friendly way? Yeah. And this is Alice from Memphis, Tennessee. So a pollinator friendly So way. in a pollinator friendly yeah. way, um, you're not going to prevent the, the, the moth from coming in and laying egg on the plant. It's so it is happen. a moth? It is a moth, yes. yes. Uh, the lesser cantilever frill, there's a couple of different ones. Okay. Um, but you can control it with a couple of different methods. If you're wanting to be pollinator friendly, BT, which is a biological yeah. control that only affects caterpillars. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> 
we'll work on it and uh, you would apply that to the foliage. Uh, if you can't use that or it's not working for you, you can use a product like that contains carbonyl. Carborel. Close enough. Um, yeah. And uh, if you're going to do that, and this is what I use at my house a lot of times, I cut all the blooms off the plant. Oh, so nice. I remove all the flowers, whether it's on a uh, knockout rose that I'm spraying for Japanese beetles or the, the canna leaf roller, I cut the flowers off before I apply the product. Okay. And then I'm not worried about the bees getting the product oh, on them. And so that, that's good a good deal. way. With that canna leaf roller, you need to start early in the season because then once it gets down in that funnel, that, that yeah. rolled up leaf, and, and it knits it together with its silk threads. It's hard it's to get tough. the product down in there. Yeah. And it's very frustrating. Uh, if you've got a bad <laughs> yeah. case of it, the best thing to do is just cut all the foliage off yeah, and dispose of it, not in, not in the compost, sure. in the trash, or burn it. Um, and then just fertilize them well and they'll put out new growth again. Cannas are right. good about okay. jumping right back. Oh yeah, cannas are tough. Okay. So uh, you can just you know, cut it down and start all over. So how early again in the season would you? Well, I, I would start, I mean, I've had them as early as is, is the first of May, depending wow. on the okay. season yeah. of the year, but yeah. typically yeah. it's more late May when I start okay. seeing them. This year, I was, it was about the middle of May when I first saw my first ones this year. And then, so I started the, the process. They aggravated me so oh. bad, I've just all but quit <laughs> having cannons. So we've I eliminated. Love them. I love them. <laughs> I've eliminated all the cannons here except in maybe three spots because wow. I just couldn't take care of it all. Mm -hmm. And in my house, I, I've stuck with two that I really like, Bengal Tiger and Tropicana, that I really grow for the foliage anyway, so okay. I keep the flowers cut off all the time. Oh, so you do? And then okay. I don't have to worry about, don't worry about spraying. Oh, I really grow sense. them for the foliage, mm -hmm. so. Good deal. I figured Jason would like that one. <laughs> all right. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, Celeste. You're that was welcome. fun. Yeah, that was fun. fun. That was good. good. That. Thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. We are about halfway through the growing season and I hope your garden is doing well. If something is not growing quite right, go to familyplotgarden.com. We have hundreds of videos about all sorts of garden problems. And if you can't find your problem, ask us your gardening question. You can do it on the website too. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.